Welcome everyone to Happy Maths Hour. This is with the wonderful Tony Beard and myself. We know it's five o'clock London time uh, on a Monday because it's Happy Maths Hour. So Tony is go has prepared this amazing activity based on Escher. And if you have, or Isha, I don't know if it's Escher or Isha. Probably Escher because he's Dutch. It must be Escher. Um, anyway, Tony actually met him, I think. Um, no, no, anyway. no, 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 no. No, didn't meet him. Coxeter. Yeah, but we'll come okay. to Coxeter okay. a bit later. You okay. Gonna, okay, so she's met somebody he worked with. And um, it's just, it's a visual spectacle that's coming up in the next hour. And and also it, it's it's very it's very mesmerizing and it is mind blowing and you also we also have to do some thinking we have to go and there are some things which I still don't have I have I'll be I keep hearing them again and again and again so um, I am looking forward to reviewing this and it's fascinating so uh, Tony here we kind go of over to you we're going to have a conversation because i'm learning and learning and learning so hopefully I, my questions will help you and please put questions up in the comments and yeah oh right yes i've got to share this haven't i we could like say hello first before we you disappear or get minimized no nope, i'm going to just go out and here we go okay here we go now today we're going to be talking about esha but his work was really very mathematical, very precisely planned. Now, this is an intriguing slide because I can see Caroline in this slide. Caroline, you should uh, perhaps tell us about this exhibition. This was an, an absolute pleasure. I was in Madrid in Spain, as you, as you do. I was brought up there, so it's not surprising. And... I have a wonderful colleague who is teaches maths at a polytechnic, but he, outside of normal work, he does a lot of maths engagement. He's a mathematician, and he's like, "There's an Escher exhibition in town!" So we we raced over there and we had a wonderful time. And the thing is, Escher isn't just. We will see some of the things he's famous for here, but he, it's all about it's all about perspective. It's about well, it's about. He must have had an extraordinary brain to be able to actually reproduce ideas that, like the impossible staircase. Have you heard of the impossible staircase? He managed to make a picture of the impossible staircase. And so many I, I different kind of, yeah. images and so I, much I, maths in them. And you can but see that all the, the walls curving and he can actually make it look, look real. And oh, it is, yes. And what you see here is quite a lot of other people looking out a window, a little man sitting on a bench, somebody walking along a corridor in an art gallery. But then magically, uh, the people who created this exhibition were very clever because they created the possibility of you seeing your friend in Escher's picture. I think that's just extraordinary. So what about Escher? Well, he was born right at the end of the 19th century and lived until 1972. So he was a graphic artist and he did a lot of woodcuts, lithographs and mezzotints. He explored space in different dimensions and in particular, filling of space by regularly repeating patterns. That's called tessellation in mathematics. He worked with mathematical objects and also mathematical operations, including hyperbolic geometry, impossible objects, as Caroline just mentioned, explorations of infinity, reflection and symmetry, as you saw in particular reflection in the sli earlier slide. With perspective, well, of course, all artists work with perspective but his he's intrigued by perspective and does a lot of strange things with perspective um he goes in, into rabbit holes with perspective doesn't he, right. he really investigates it mm, deeply mm. and very successfully and he does things like um, having creatures crawling out of two dimensions, very definitely in two dimensions, and then suddenly 
coming out of two dimensions into three dimensions and then back into two dimensions. But of course, all, you're seeing this in a two dimensional picture, but the three dimensions looks incredibly real. But he's doing this in order to explore the differences and the sort of merging of the different dimensions and what we see in them. And that's without computers, no CGI, <laughs> just no, exactly. pen and paper. <laughs> And then polyhedra, and we'll look at some of those. Now, he didn't have any formal mathematical training. Apparently, he didn't do terribly well in school, as a lot of other geniuses. That applies to a lot of other really high-performing people. Uh, he, he believed he'd no mathematical ability. But he did his own research into tessellation, which we mentioned earlier. And he interacted with mathematicians, with George Pollier, Penrose, who was at Oxford, uh, Coxeter, who was an Englishman who um, spent most of his uh, career in, in Toronto, Canada, <clears throat> and then the crystallographer, Friedrich Haag. Now, of course, the way things fit together in space is very, very important in crystallography, um, how matter is fitted together, and a, a very common example of that of course is the beehive the the um uh, the, the hexagonal tessellation there so that's escher so let's explore some of his work now this picture is uh, one of my very favorites and we've got it hanging in our lounge at home it's called night and day and he escher put recognizable images of living things into tessellations. And he liked to use the theme of metamorphosis or changing of one form to another. And birds transform into fish and fish to frogs, for example. Now here you see the light, the white day, gradually changing into the dark, the black night, and the birds flying across the screen there, across the picture rather, and the um, white ones flying from left to right, and the black ones flying from right to left. And, the and, two there's, and there's symmetry. If you look carefully at that picture, the two rivers are symmetrical. The, the towns, that there's Two similar, they're not identical, but they're very similar because you can see the symmetry. And it's it, this, this, I could just stare at this picture for hours. There's so much you can, the detail. there's so much you can see in it, isn't there? And, 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 and just thinking about the mind that created this mm -hmm. thought he wasn't good at maths. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> You're know, Caroline back in the museum, the same exhibition. And you can see here. It's not exactly as we saw it in the day and night, because we've got mirrors now, like the um, Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, parallel mirrors that are creating many, many images and images of images to give these birds in 3D space. And you've got them, if you look, they are reversed. So. The white birds are, if you look, go back along a line, flying towards you, and then the next one's flying away from you, and the next one behind that is flying towards you again. It's hard as you to see, see with Caroline as well. Yeah, you, you can see, see that. Yeah, it's hard to can... see with the line of birds at the top there, but you can see it with me. And then if you look down to the right, you can see a bird flying towards you, and above that, so if you look at the reflection that's to that's that way. That so way, this, that's uh, that way, be behind me, that way. There's the, the one lower down that's that's flying towards me and the one next one up is flying away from me. Yes, and it, it's definitely not Escher, but it, this is created as part of this Escher um, ex exhibition at Madrid. And, uh, and it's the same sort of theme of birds repeated. And here you see it again, the same d display with with just one Caroline, not not the luxury of lots and lots of Carolines, <laughs> but one repeated again by reflections. I think that's amazing. 
It was, it was, if you ever get a chance to see the Escher exhibition, please go. It travels around the world. Go. Well, there are, you can also go to um, Holland and the, the permanent museum there with a lot of ex exhibits, not as sort of fanciful as this, but much more detail about his work and showing you his various woodcuts and stages at which, you know, the, of the woodcut, the way he made his, um, his uh, woodcuts. Now here, this isn't Escher. It, this is a compilation inspired by Escher with Caroline at the back there. And this the front there, that fishes, we'll see that again. That's a bit of Escher. Um, but he didn't do works like this with sort of different, you know, big changes from one to another um, in this way. At least uh, I could be wrong, but it, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong. But it, it seems to me it's more something like the, like the Mirrors one inspired by Escher. Mm -hmm. Now here we get on to some of the real Escher. And this is the this is what Esh inspired Escher as as opposed to inspired by Escher. It was the other way around. What we're seeing here. Yes. Well, as a young man, Escher went and worked in Italy for a few years, and he took a trip to Spain. I rather imagine him as a young, a bit romantic, really, as a young backpacker, like young people do in their gap years now. But he would have had all his artists um, stuff with him so he could do his painting and, and his work. Yeah, maybe so, he travelled in style and had his own carriage and Yeah, I don't speed. think so. Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think he was a rich uh, aristocrat from Northern Europe. No, he, he was inspired at Alhambra, which is a Moorish palace in Granada in Spain. It, it, it's in Barcelona, no, it's in Granada. It's, it's in Granada, not far from yeah. It's, it's the, not far yeah. from Barcelona. Okay, it's, well, it's, it, it, it is Tony. It's in the south. It's in the. It's in Andalusia. It's in the southern. It's not not that far from um, Gibraltar. It's right, and it, it is it is amazing, and it, because the uh, Muslims didn't believe in depicting the human form in any way in art and uh, even living creatures. So theirs was entirely abstract art. And you see on the left, a designer's Alhambra, um, which is uh, based on <clears throat> uh, threefold symmetry, um, based on triangles, but you can see how those shapes are all fitted together. And in the middle there, that's just a sketch from Escher's notebook, which was a study of the design on the left. <clears throat> and then a few years later, he made that into not just a design, but an actual art um, a production, uh, which he called hexagonal tessellation. And it's, and it, the subtitle is the study of regular division of the plane with reptiles. Now you can see three, if you take where, for example, the three, um, what is it? The three, ha uh, arms oh actually yeah. rear it's legs it's kind of across the shoulders it's either across the shoulders or across the thigh if you look across the shoulder uh, of some i was across, looking at the rear the legs the other the rear, yes, yeah I, but then that converts into the arms so the rear legs then you go to the next rear legs and then you go across the shoulders across the shoulders and then across the rear legs again something like that it's, yeah but i was really looking at the points the points of rotational symmetry where you get three of the um the, oh, the three meeting. Really intertwined They're, they meet at a point and yeah. then the green rotates into the red rotates into the um lighter cream colored one so you can rotating about the, the diagram about a point now that's threefold right, okay. rotational symmetry so yeah. it is essentially a development of the symmetries we talk about symmetry not just in mathematics, not just to be reflection, but to um, we talk we the symmetries uh, plural are all the different sorts of ways in which the di the diagram transforms images of one motif or small part of the diagram. Mo can be you can imagine them moving around or re by reflection to another copy of the same motif.
I so there we have. Actually, I'm glad you pointed that out, Tony, because I hadn't actually noticed that. I've seen that in other in other um, images, but I hadn't noticed that because that's the one place. Oh, you got it with the heads as well. I was going to say, that, that where have you got that? Because with the front legs, you don't have that repeated pattern so much. Well, they're cheeks. But, uh, they're, they're, they're that's cheeks. what I'm saying. It's the heads, the cheeks. So you got the that with the cheek. three heads, yeah, and then you got that with the rear, one one of the rear legs, and yeah. I hadn't noticed that. So that that really does help you see the rotational symmetry there. Hmm. But it's it's just mind-boggling that it it really it just does continue and it's you can look at these things can't you on on and just just um, keep, yeah get absorbed keep, in them yeah get yeah and can keep noticing different things so at a recent happy mass hour we talked about spirals and introduced the idea of stereographic projection now i'm just going to give you permission here to just sit back and watch the show so feel free to jump in, but feel free to just watch the show and and just accept what's being said, because <laughs> this is one of the areas where I struggle. That doesn't mean you will struggle, but it's OK to just let it flow over you and just enjoy the concept. Sorry, Tony, go ahead. Well, this is used in um, in map making. So one of the projections that puts the globe, what we have on the Earth, our continents and cities and all the rest, onto a, uh, onto a flat map in the atlas is stereographic projection. It's not now the usual one used, but it is very much the way that mathematicians um, study spherical geometry now that is geometry on the surface of the sphere and you see in Escher's work there of course sphere spirals you can see a um, square grid on that little squares they look a bit distorted perhaps because they're on the surface of the sphere not onto the flat plane now what you see in yellow on that is a spiral on the surface of the sphere, but what it maps, it's a mapping um, from, consider it's a mapping from the sphere to the plane or from the plane to the sphere. What it is, is a mapping of a spiral in the plane, okay, which is the same width everywhere. Now, so if it was, if it was not on a sphere, would it just be a, like a cylindrical spiral? Yes. Okay, so, so it's the equivalent. You, the equivalent. I mean, I don't even know what language to use here. Is it the equivalent, of, like a, a, a spherical equivalent of a spiral? A spiral in if it's just a, a cylinder, is that you? That's not Euclidean, is it? It's well, a, that, no, it is actually because is. if you imagine taking the um, oh, you label, can flatten. You can flatten a spiral. You can flatten a cylinder, so it is yes, Euclidean. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, um, so, but this is not um, between a cylinder. Uh, this projection is not here. It's no. not between a cylinder and um, the plane. It's between a, a, a sphere and the plane. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And you see the, the diagram in the middle, no down, is showing you that the, the lines go from the North Pole and they project the points on the sphere to, I mean, when I say project, I mean, it's the point P on the sphere has an image P dashed on the plane, okay? And uh, all the points of the sphere have got images in the plane. And the center of the sphere, O, is its image is the South Pole. And imagine a map on the, imagine the earth, um, imagine the earth with the UK where we are or South Africa where some people listening to this are or wherever you are on the earth, then your town would be, would be mapped onto the, uh, the flat map by a stereographic projection like this. And it's another thought is, where does the North Pole map to? It's different from every other point. And it was the, the, the one of the, this is where the thinking, if, I, if I'm correct in what I'm thinking here, this is where a mathematician has no limits. There's a clue <laughs> for you. 
<laughs> an engineer which is what i am you're like well that's just pointless it's not possible so there's no point let's make it as accurate as we possibly can within specifications within certain tolerance and within that we're done <laughs> not a mathematician mathematician we can travel to infinity in our minds well everybody can i mean i'm not a real mathematician i'm just a teacher but no um, in ma with mathematics everyone can fly to infinity like space fiction but it's not it's something else it, can we just go back to that for one second tony because because it, it was it just i found it it is fascinating that from that that north point you literally cover an infinite 2d plane as in a 2d plane that never ends because the the angle that from the north pole is actually parallel well it's not i don't know if it's parallel well i suppose it is parallel isn't it so that's that's not a 2d plane that's messing with my head again but it's it it, it just keeps the angle keeps getting closer and closer to 90 degrees so that it's extending just to infinity literally and so to project one sphere, you can project it across an infinite 2D plane, which I, I just think that's, I, I, I really like that. I'm well, quite Caroline, happy to sit how about, and absorb that. How about this, Caroline? You have an infinite flat piece of paper. Uh oh, yes. And then you wrap it up and it covers the sphere, but in so doing, there are no crinkles in the paper. Mm. <laughs> yeah, now that that's lovely? messing with my head again. But yes, it's lovely. Yes, <laughs> it's it's a, again a mathematical concept which is there is real, as in it's mathematically true. It's and and the thing is, it's true. It's infinite, and then you can actually put it on a sphere that's only this big. <laughs> How? <laughs> How? Because there are infinite amount of points on a sphere. It's it's yeah. And there are yeah, infinite yeah. number of points in the plane. And, it, and there's yeah. a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. Okay, let's move on to the dodeca the stellated dodecahedron, no less. Yeah. So it's called a dodecahedron because do means two and deca means ten, so it adds up to twelve. Hedron means, well, in Greek it means, it faced, means faces. faces. So this is... 12 faces and that's f equals 12 on my slide there and there are 30 edges and 12 vertices now and now with this just i just want to make something to in case anybody get this if you're counting all the edges of go that are going out into those peaks the little mountain tops you're actually counting across all the way from one peak to the next one that is an edge in in the stellated dodecahedron if you've ever seen a dodecahedron that's not stellated it is just like a ball with 12 12 faces are all pentagons and doesn't have the little peaks sticking out so just that every edge is goes all the way from the tip of one peak to the tip of the, the it, it, peak. it is mind blowing, isn't it? You can yeah. see here um, that there are twelve pentagramic faces, as Caroline described. Okay, each of which, um, <clears throat> well, there's five pentagrams meeting at each vertex, which is fantastic. Um, so, oh, you can have, well, look at, look at this, this, this is the sculpture there at the University of Twente in, um, Holland, I think, um, is, um, one of, uh, I don't think Escher actually produced it himself. I think it was produced from his designs, um, and cast in some metal there, beautiful thing. Um, but what you see in gravitation on the right is turtles, yellow turtles and blue turtles and green and orange turtles. And each of those little um, sort of pyramids um, on the uh, stellated dodecahedron replaces the turtle shell. And you see the turtles have got no shells, not proper, sh not their original shells. Oh, I thought they were 
somehow humanoid, and then I thought they were monsters, and then and they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're actually bit... creepy, aren't they? Yeah, I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> but it I is wish clever. Teddy bears, but they are clever, definitely clever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they're poking their heads out of the little trapezoidal doorways. Yeah, I wouldn't want that on my wall. It'd give me nightmares, but it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> and then... I put in here a picture of the pentagram. So that shows you what Caroline was describing. The lines there, if you start at one of the outer points and carry on, we imagine drawing that line, you have got five edges. Before you get back to your starting point, you've got five edges. And then inside that, you've got a pentagon. And you can put one of these pentagrams, which are the stars, inside it. And inside that, you can put another one. And inside that, you can put another one. And so it and goes guess on. guess what? The engineer has to stop at some point, no matter how fine he can make the he or she. Or he. I'm an engineer. What am I talking about? The engineer can make the, 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 the drawing. But the mathematician never needs to stop it can go on to infinite infinitesimally small uh, that's yeah i love i just love that just it, let your mind infinitely go, large infinitely. caroline because that construction Absolutely. can carry on outwards as well as inwards wow infinitely <laughs> love it <laughs> okay so you can see what pleasure obviously esha had himself in creating these mathematical images and also gets given to other people now we'll move to something else and that is people think of geometry as the geometry they learnt at school which is euclidean geometry the classical euclidean geometry and that's on a flat plane and there you see it depicted by the middle of those three uh, images angels and devils can you see the black devils First thing I see is the angels. I live in the with I live with the angels. Yeah, <laughs> but actually, <laughs> funnily they enough, could be bats. They could be. We could just call them bats. They don't have to be devils. But in, in the depiction, you can see the arms. They could be bats. We could call them bats. <laughs> I don't like devils. <laughs> no, I think they're devils definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, in the circle limit thing, it's the devils I see first. Yeah, the one on the right. The yeah. one on the right. Yeah, the circle limit. Is if you, yeah. it's it's the circular depiction of of, of that when you Probably. say circle limit it's not it's um is that is that the um is that the hyperbolic that, that is yes okay. that is but I mean it, uh, actually <clears throat> the mind plays tricks because one minute you focus on the angels and the next minute it's on the devils mm. <laughs> yeah it's um, a nice optical illusion but it's yeah. but it's it's just the fact that this is where. Escher went he didn't it wasn't enough to make these incredible 2d images he had to then depict them on a sphere and then again in a representation of a mathematics that's it's called hyperbolic and you'll see it in a minute but if you notice that get the 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 angels and the devils get on the circle on the right the angels and the devils get smaller and smaller and smaller as they go out but Mathematically, they're not smaller. No, isn't it? That is amazing. So we've got three geometries here, all depicting the same tessellation, but the one on the left is on a sphere. On the surface of the sphere, you've got the angels and devils uh, fitting together in this repeating pattern, and that is spherical geometry, or or um, elliptic geometry, as it's sometimes called. Then the middle one is, as I said, just, just for for those of us that aren't experts at this, is that does that apply to cones as well? The elliptical geometry? No. No. Okay. No. Just checking. Um, it, it's it, it's it's well, mm, it, it's the geometry. As far as I understand it, it's the geometry on the surface of a sphere. Well, okay. not really. Even that. Okay, it's it's a particular sort of geometry with some axioms, which we will explore in a minute. Okay. And one of the models for it is the surface of a sphere. Okay, we'll just okay. leave it at that for now. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's as I understand well, it. Well, it's just because uh, when you said elliptical, I'm imagining when you do a cross section of a cone where you get an um, elliptical shape. So. That's a good question. That's a good yeah. yes, yes, because you get the various conic sections and mm. and the, the ellipse is set and the hyperbola are both conic sections. Okay. Um, but, uh, so when you come into the mathematics, there's something called elliptic functions and hyperbolic functions, and uh, well, anyway. Basically, the mass yep. is, is 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 translated from one to the other, and the correspondences um, so, are uh, there. Is the conclusion I come to here is that this man who thought he didn't, he couldn't do mathematics. <laughs> it's like, oh, what? <laughs> He's interpreting oh, all these were... concepts that I'm like, okay, I'm. Carolina, I don't think he listed the. I don't think he listed the axioms, and I, I actually don't think. He, he worked with the formulae, not much no, but anyway. He used the concepts to create his art. That's it, doesn't it, I'm not he saying did. that you know, he doesn't have to put them on paper, he's represented them physically. Uh, it's just, I just think it's amazing, right? Okay, sorry. Keep uh, and the book that I, I took these from is a book that I've had for many years called The Magic of MC Escher. Um, published by Thames and Hudson. It is a beautiful book. And so, I, and you can see with the pages, I found those those diagrams in order to compile that. Um, yes, so now, what is this? Just as um, spherical geometry is on the surface of a sphere, one of the models, apart from the the, the, the circle, another model, another surface on which we can think of doing um, hyperbolic geometry is on saddle-shaped surfaces. Now you can see these cooling tires from the power station, the Didcot power station, I think it is. You can see the cooling tires, towers. Um, they're, not, they're not cylinders, they are sort of they've got a, a curve inwards as you go up there's an inward and then an outward curve and as you go if you're on any one point as you go around them you you, you sort of dip down or if dipping down is as you imagine that's a saddle between two hills there in the, the picture on the left and that's another surface where you which can be a model for or can be the surface on which you can think of hyperbolic geometry playing out. Is it out. the same on my scissor handles? Yes, and on our bodies, we've got a lot of these um, surf, uh, uh, these parts of our bodies, like the surface where between our thumb and our first finger, we can go up the thumb and up the first finger, or we can go down onto the back and have our hand and the front of our hand. So right in that dip, we've got a saddle. So everybody's, yeah, yeah uh, all our, our, lots of saddles everywhere, really, once you start mm. looking for them. And, of mm. course, on the horse. <laughs> I mean, not yeah. on the horse, but what you ride, what you put on the back of a horse. Mm. Okay. So now here's a very geometrical picture. But the horse which... does have that because they do have that. Um, it goes up and down and, and it goes along either side of the horse it goes up to the neck and 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 then it well, goes the, up the, to the rump it yeah up to the, the neck up to the rump and then down on either side so the horse yeah, does have right. that shape as well yeah yeah so that's the saddle shape saddle surface okay now here you have a mathematical sort of representation um of the three different geometries you have what is called positive curvature for elliptic geometry or spherical geometry, as it's often called. You have Euclidean geometry, which has no curvature, everything's flat. And you have hyperbolic geometry, which with negative curvature. Now, what we're talking about here is the shortest distance between any two points, which is a straight line or the technical term for it is geodesic okay that's the shortest distance between two points and it is what everybody thinks of as a straight line in the euclidean plane which is the top of those pictures now on the left with euclidean oh no sorry with elliptic geometry you've got positive curvature so on the surface of the sphere 
the straight line of geodesic is a great circle, like a line of longitude, a part of a line of longitude. Okay. This is a concept that I uh, I still haven't managed to visualize it. I've, I've kind of seen it and I've done it on a ball. So if you actually draw a line on a ball, it is a curve. And it's, if you look at it from up above, it looks like a straight line. But of course, it, it isn't. It's on a curve. If you look but, at it from the side, it's, it's, it is on an arc. But there is no shorter way of joining those two points apart from drilling through the earth. <laughs> Which, if you have a say an an air an air a balloon, that's going to destroy the balloon. So that's not an option. That's a nice way. But, of but, doing but it. you can drill through the through the um, you can drill underground. We but can. then it might get a bit hot. But you wouldn't be on the surface. And the whole point of this geometry is it stays on the surface. So, okay. yeah, the only way I've, I've been able to visualize it is by just if you're looking from above down onto the sphere, it looks like a straight line. But if you look from the side, it, it isn't, it's an arc of a circle. Well, yes, but it, it, it is it might not be a circle. It, it, it's, it is a circle. It's, it is it's a, a circle. great circle. It's like a line of longitude. Okay. But if we, if we are, um, mm, if we're thinking of curv uh, curvature as uh, Euclidean and I see it, we're, we're talking about curvature every time, curved arcs, okay? Or we're talking about zero curvature uh, as in the Euclidean plane. Now, if you look about uh, uh, the hyperbolic geometry on that surface, as you see on the right there, Imagine it as your um, <clears throat> your dip between two hills, but it's cur it, it curves down from front to back and up when you start in the mid middle of the dip and you go to left or right. Now, staying on that surface, your um, your straight line on the surface, which as Caroline says, if you look from above. It looks straight in the Euclidean sense. Is from, seen from the side. It's a curve, but that's what we call negative curvature. I've just realised something, Tony. This can actually be represented. I can actually make pictures when we do our, our eventually it's a really professional video of this. I can do this. All these three represented with bubbles because you can easily make a sphere with bubbles. You can make a flat <laughs> surface by putting it inside a flat surface. And I can make the hyperbolic shape with bubbles. That would be very nice. Wouldn't it? And, mm, and I have got a, a ball in South Africa that you can you can draw on um, and you can represent these things. You can represent spherical geometry on it nicely. But mm. you can do it with a ping pong ball and a fine pen, you know. Or a balloon. Make a balloon nice and spherical. Well, and you... Okay, okay, um, you can. Um, uh, we'll try it sometime. Mm. So, so now we'll come on to our circles. So imagine standing at the North Pole, and you go, you you, you go half a, a unit, half a meter or something, in every direction, and mark the points around you. That's all half a meter away from the North Pole. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that will be a circle on the surface of the earth. You can do it mm -hmm. on a balloon or on a ping pong ball. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, so the center of that circle is the North Pole, and and it's and a circle is half a meter in radius away from the North Pole. Okay, that's the red circle that has the pi figure in the number one. Okay, I'm I'm there. I'm with you. I'm on the North Pole with you. Now, if you draw a circle with diameter one on the flat plane then the, the distance all the way around which we call the circumference is pi and that's how pi is defined it's the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle right so the length of that circle the length of that um curve around the edge the distance around the edge of the flat circle is pi 
on the sphere it's less than pi yeah and you can see why because to make the shape you have to be inside to make it a straight a euclidean straight line it has to go inside the sphere so the line outside the sphere is going to be longer no shorter it's less than pi sorry shorter. the line exactly. across no no you're confusing Matic. caroline i'm you're guessing i'm guessing it wrong you're confusing the the line through, which is the yes, straight line, sorry. yeah, yeah, with the yeah. line around, yeah, which is the circle. Yeah, no, no, so, yeah, it's going to be more. It's like it's like the the triangle. Yes. yes what is going, going to, be to be more, Caroline? It's the it is the Euclidean circle that's more than the one on the sphere. The s circle on the sphere is shorter. The distance around the circle on the sphere is shorter. Yeah, that's what that's. You know what? I don't know if I said longer or short, but I meant shorter. I don't know what I said, but I meant shorter. Okay. And I know, so I know why I said it. I know what my mental representation is of it, but I might have it wrong. So let's move to the yeah, hyperbolic geometry. Okay. Now then, imagine at the bottom of the dip there between the two hills, right? Imagine drawing your circle, which are all the joining all the points that are exactly half a meter or half a unit from your center, okay? And what will you get? You'll get a sort of bent sort of circle. Yeah, you can have a circle. And it will go uh, on the saddle, it'll go down on the sort of flanks of the horse, as it were, and up towards the neck and tail of the horse. And in so doing, the flat circle will have to stretch if it's to go onto the surface of your saddle. So if you, if you had a model of that shape, which is that you could have a, a um, there, there are things you can find that that shape or make one out of clay or something and then you could put plasticine on to mold it into the actual shape that it would be and, to, and you'd have to make sure it had a, yeah, a circle. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's actually quite, um, you just imagine it, close your eyes and think about it mm. and I think you'll be able to imagine it, everybody out there. Okay, so the middle pictures there are parallel lines. Now, what you have, one of the Euclid's axioms was that if you have a, a line and you have another point that's not on the line, then there's one and only one parallel line to your given line, right? So any, you can have, you have at most two, uh, uh, well, well you, you're specifying the distance apart. Well, you're specifying a point that's not on your first line. And then there's only one line through that point. Whereas, so there, are, there are many lines because they can go no, away. No, there from aren't many lines, and... Caroline, not in the plane. There are, oh, there's only for, for any given line and a point not on the line, let's call that oh, a P for this point that's not on the line. There's only one line through P parallel to your original line. And now for um right the, so in other words you're, you're you've, you've got a point that isn't on it's, it's away let's it's somewhere that's not on that parallel line there's only one place it goes do, 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 bing. there's only one place where it's going to be where it's going to be parallel to the parallel lines uh perpendicular to the parallel lines no not perpendicular parallel if you have a line Think of a line. I'm not, yeah, I'm not. I don't think I've ever understood this when you said it. So I won't be the only one. So yes, please go ahead. Please think of a line. I'm thinking of a line. I've got a line. I've got so a line. Close your eyes and think. Of got a my line. eyes closed. I'm thinking of a line. On a flat piece of paper. It's on right. a flat piece of paper. Now think of a point that's not on that line. Okay. Now you can only draw one parallel line through your away from it point that is parallel to your original line right only um, one yes uh, yes i see it now so i only start i didn't start with two because i'm looking at this image that has two parallel two lines that are parallel to each other so i actually only starting with one i'm starting with one line and i've got to draw a parallel line that runs through point p there is only one uh, yes on a you could on a flat euclidean 2d surface yeah, there's only one so, right, got so, you now, yeah. if you then go to the sphere, yeah, okay, and you have a single line, I'm okay, drawing a single line on my sphere, and, yeah, and then 
you take some other point of the sphere not on, so the lines are not going to coincide. They're not going to be the same line. That would be boring. They're going to be different lines. Your pair of lines are going to be different lines. Okay. Well, I've got a point P that isn't on the original right. line. And, so and I couldn't help myself. I had to complete the circle. My mind just completed the circle on the sphere. Right. So then what you what you've got to so go back to the beginning, if you visualize this, mm -hmm. you have got a line on the sphere, which is a great circle. Mm -hmm. uh, and you take another somewhere else on the sphere and you, you can't you, every line uh, every other line on the sphere every others will will intersect your great circle in two points there are no parallels on the surface of a sphere See, parallelism I I, I is, doesn't exist parallelism doesn't exist on the surface of a sphere See, in my imagination i'm imagining a smaller circle that no no that's not a straight that is not a circle caroline you've not got sorry it might be a circle in your head but it's yes. not a straight line we okay. are talking about great circles which are straight okay. lines okay right i'm going to just leave it at that and i, mean, I can imagine because so i shouldn't be completing the circle then the you could complete the circle as long as as long as you're always talking about straight lines and straight lines are great circles which cut the sphere if you go through them into two hemispheres now you can do that anywhere right you can cut your sphere into two oh hemispheres. into two hemispheres so it's it's halving it's going to halve the circle yeah the sphere and, uh, it's going to halve the sphere. whatever it is those two points the, the, the great circle to complete it is going to halve the sphere. So if you halve the sphere, it's not possible for any any other great circle that it's halves the, halve sphere the sphere to in not, another way. To halve not it to cut. It would not necessarily to go through it. cut. Right. I've got it now. Okay, there's, thank you. There's no parallels on the surface of a sphere. Okay, I see. So the great circle halves is cut, cut, cuts the sphere basically into two hemispheres right so, it's, and, it, so it's not possible I, I got it now i've got it i might have forgotten it tomorrow tony but right now i've got it right so when you go to hyperbolic geometry right there are infinitely many parallels so when you have a straight line in your hyperbolic geometry <laughs> there's always infinitely many lines that are equidistant from it somewhere else in the geometry okay, okay. like you've got to think of parallels as railway lines and the flat surface all right mm -hmm. um and in hyperbolic geometry there's no uh, 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 all uh, there's infinitely many parallel lines parallel to a given line okay, okay. So let's move on to triangles okay it's pretty well known that if you have any triangle, any shaped triangle, not just an isosceles one as here, the three angles of the triangle add up to 180 degrees. Yep. Okay. Now, in spherical geometry, they add up to more than 180 degrees because of the positive curvature. Yep. Uh, and in um, hyperbolic geometry, because of this effect of negative curvature, the angles add up to less than 180. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? I think it's, it's yeah. lovely. I think yeah, it's lovely. I, I agree. It's, it's mind-boggling and it's lovely, and I still think it's amazing that Escher was able to create these representations of, of this mathematics without being a mathematician. I think it's... Now, here's a couple of Escher um, woodcuts um, dating from a little later on in his life, 59 and 64. They're both of the same subject. Okay, they're both fishes. And again, it has got this um, symmetry here where you've got three fishes' noses meeting at a point with the tails between them. Okay, here you have on the left, you have a very strange thing that's not really you. Uh, it's 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 strange because it's 
uh, uh, really, in speaking, it's, it's supposed to be on the plane and the fishes get smaller as they get to the edge. Now, Escher was doing that sort of exploration of infinity and getting gradually smaller and smaller forever and ever towards the edge. He was doing that sort of exploration quite early on in his career, uh, much, much before this, this particular one I've, I've picked out to show. And he then, uh, as, as I understand it, he then met with a mathematician called um, Coxeter, Harold Coxeter, at a, uh, when Coxeter came to a, a conference in Europe. And Coxeter was intrigued by Escher's work because Coxeter was a geometer, a geometer, one of the leading ge geometers of his time. And he, he was working in hyperbolic geometry where they use this spherical, uh, not spherical, I don't mean that, they use this circular unit circle as a model of the um, hyperbolic plane. And because you define distance differently in hyperbolic geometry, right, it has a different definition. By the definition of distance in hyperbolic geometry, all those fishes are hyperbolically the same size. And that's what we saw with the circle in that two slides before, which again is... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is... So that is um, Escher playing with this concept of the limit limit in a square limit and a circle limit. In fact, he did a whole series of of both of them. This is circle limit three, and that is our explanation exploration for today of Escher. But there is so much more. And so we're going to do another another um, happy mass hour on on Escher, aren't we, Caroline? Yes, I, yes, definitely. And what I'd love to do is actually because I know there's there's ways we can I can prepare them in advance. There's ways of of, of doing this, of creating these yourself, not on the hyperbolic plane, just on the Euclidean, the flat plane. And you can, um, and we'll 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 do that, and we will be creating videos where you can you can create this kind of art, and you're not limited to the shapes that Escher has has used. It doesn't have to be fish and angels and devils. There are random shapes you can make that literally you can um, tessellate the plane with in a, in this mes mesmerizing way <laughs> and so i'd love to include that in the well, we, we can do a, a separate one on 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 tessellation because mm. basically uh, i was thinking of us doing a, a happy massage on on escher's work oh yeah uh, sure no and, absolutely and, and absolutely various geometry. i mean for example this uh, this afternoon we haven't explored this whole idea of metamorphosis Mm. And there is a very famous, very long um, uh, artwork called, called Metamorphosis. And you start at one end and ever so gradually the images in this tessellation change in their form. And what you saw as birds become fish and then they become frogs and then and so it goes on and on and it's wow. very, oh, very I haven't long seen that. it's several yes it, I, it's I, I think it's several meters long it's a huge thing it's not very it's a strip it's not very tall from top to bottom but mm. it spreads around a long wall and um and that is showing the whole idea of continuous change in mathematics. Morph and uh, morphing is doing also the, the concept of morphing, which is very familiar again from CGI and, and modern day graphics. Morphing is exactly. extremely common. Uh, and this is a gradual change. Now, um, we have it in any measurement we take. Um, if you're an engineer, you measure discreetly to the nearest millimeter or some, something smaller if it's necessary to do so. Whereas if you're a mathematician, you're interested in this um, 
infinitely with between any two points you've got infinitely many points so you've got if you're talking about the distance between those two points you've got as close as two every two two points are cl uh, can be as close as you like to think of them and In, uh, infinitesimally small space in, between them but it's right and and there's your mathematician's point of view hmm. so you've got you have got um discrete change in uh, and there's a whole sort of branch of mathematics which deals only it's called discrete mathematics surprise surprise which deals only in these these sort of jumps really from one um, measure to the next and so mm. on right, um, that, bearing in mind those infinitesimal changes yes and then you've got the continuous mathematics which is um, which is thinking of the infinitely many impact, you know, just getting smaller and smaller forever and ever. And, yeah. and infinitely many points on a line, for example, which indeed there are in our concept, mathematical concept of points. Hmm. But as you say, as an engineer, you can't draw them, can you, Caroline? Yeah, it's, but that's the wonderful thing. And when I do the, my, my presentations, I t tell the children that, that the, the one thing that they all have that means they can be great mathematicians is their imagination because this can only be done in your imagination it's the only place on earth that it can be done mm, mm. so Don't we will do me. we'll do another happy mass art on tessellation brilliant and there you take something like a, a hexagonal grid or a, a triangle a, tri a grid of triangles or a grid of squares, squares. Mm -hmm. and then whatever you've decided you're going to start with, you then begin to, to push a little bit out on one edge into the next, um, well, from one triangle, say, into the next triangle beside it. But you do a corresponding intrusion, pushing in. So mm -hmm. every bit you push out, you push another one in, into mm -hmm. that shape. And do it systematically with every shape in your in your picture. Mm. And so, um, if you're very clever and quite artistic, you can produce a little simple animal or a design um, that is repeating itself. Um, as 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 you look at one of these shapes, then sort of like a jigsaw, but a very regular jigsaw the next piece fits into it and it fits into the next piece so we can give you some methods for, for doing this yourself and we'll also look at um, together at some more of Escher's works and how he explored these mathematical ideas like the idea of of infinity like the idea of continuous change and of course tessellation and we haven't really gone in very much. We haven't much. looked at the impossible staircase, the impossible shapes either and at we, all, um, there's so we much to look at. And we haven't looked yet at the other idea of studying different dimensions, two dimensions, three dimensions mm. and possibly even more dimensions. <laughs> okay, so, so I think our hour out. is up, yep, Caroline. That's it, yes. So we'll see you all next week five o'clock London time. Thank you for joining us. And um, Tony and myself, happy maths hours. See you next week. Thank you.